Welcome everyone. I'm so pleased to have you here. I'm so pleased to be with my friend and colleague, Philippe Cohen Solal. Thank you so much, Philippe, for joining us. Thank you very let much. Me, for let me say a little bit about you. You are, um, you've been making music as an electronic music architect and self-taught composer for two decades now. You're the founder of Yabasta Records in 1995. Your aim is to give free reign to your passion and vision through um, music that's a mixture of genres. I find that really interesting. And you discovered Henry Darger several years ago and became so inspired. So we're going to chat with you a little bit now about that journey that you took with Henry Darger. Philippe, how did you become inspired to create an entire musical composition about Henry Darger? Um, I have I had a band uh, called Gotan Project, and we were touring all over the world, but including America, East Coast and West Coast. And just before uh, before coming to US, uh, before going on tour, I had a dinner with a friend, and his father was a good friend of Kyoko Lerner. And uh, so I didn't know who was Kyoko Lerner. The only information I had about her was she, she was a tango fan. So, uh, so this friend, told me to invite her to my show in Chicago. And uh, so I sent her an email and um, to invite her to my show. And it was it. And, and after I was in New York to do a, to do a, co a concert with Gotan Project, and I had a day off. And during this day off, I went to the Folk Art Museum in New York, the Folk Art Museum. And I discovered one of the first piece that I saw was uh, Henry Dogger's work. And I was completely blown away by it. You know, I was like, what is that? I was completely uh, like in love, you know, just like, uh, I like fell in love with it directly. And I saw, I was watching what, who was the artist. And I saw the name on the cartel, the name of uh, Henry Dogger. And under was written courtesy of Kyoko Lerner. And I had, um, the day after I was in Chicago to my show and I invited, Kyoko invited me for to have a tea before the show at her place, which was at Webster Avenue, which was the where the, the street where at the time she was living, um, and also where Henry Dagger has his uh, room. Um, so we talked about tango for a few minutes, and of course I, I directly asked her about Henry Dagger, who was Henry Dagger that I saw you the day before at the work at uh, Folk Art. And she started to tell me the story of uh, her tenant. And so it was completely fascinating. And she brought me to her basement where the, she showed me a lot of work at the time it was still there. And, um, and it was like first experience. And after three years later in 2006, there was a very good exhibition in Paris at La Maison Rouge. And it was um, the first real good exhibition about Henry Dagger in Paris or in France even. And uh, Kyoko came to Paris for that, for this occasion, and we met again. And I remember that I spent a lot of time in this exhibition, watching, reading, because of course, with Henry Dagger, it's visual, but it's not only visual, there is a lot of words written, even, even though I didn't know at the time that he wrote so many so many books or so many pages but i remember that when i went out from the exhibition and i met kyoko at the outside and i told her uh you know what it's it was it's amazing because there is everything there is the, the visual the writing so the only thing was is missing is the sound the music the the sound and uh and we thought and i told her that uh I thought it was very inspiring and, and I was kind of inspired to do something with which is with my specialty, which is doing music mostly. I was inspired to do some some work around that, inspired by that. And and I and Kyoko, after we talked more about that, and and she told me that um that Henry wrote some uh, lyrics. Which is not exactly poetry, in, in, so because it was really like structured as as lyrics, like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and thanks to her and thanks to Mike uh, Mike Bonsteel, uh, who researched more lyrics uh, from Henry Dagger, I, I 
they sent me a lot of a collection of of different lyrics which are, were coming from um, the realms of the unreal from the, the huge book and it started to be really the the, the beginning for me of the process of doing doing something with music at the time i didn't know exactly what to do i remember that i said to kyoko uh, you know i can imagine like like children music for for grown-ups or adult music for children something around that because of course you know it's like uh, this, this contrast between the 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 children world and the the adult world so it was more, mostly the main inspiration and in 2015 so for before even in 2008 i came back to to chicago and i spent like uh, like almost a week at uh, kyoko's place she invited me to spend to be merged mostly in Henry's work, and I spent like a week at her place. And at the, at the time, I was even I didn't know what was what I was doing there. I was I was thinking, what I'm. It's amazing to be surrounded by so much amazing work, so much such a treasure. But I didn't know how to translate it musically. And uh, but it was now I realized that this this time was very important to to go deeper in Henry's world. And I remember at the time also she recommended me recommended me to go to the to Intuit to see the room, the the, the and um, and so I went there and of course it was for me interesting also to see for real you know everything you know which is in the room which is uh, yeah you know the furniture the uh, what what you call for the painting and you know this all the things all the the tools that he used. So, so that's, and, and in 2015, there was an exhibition in Paris, very important retrospective at Musée d'Art Moderne that you can see by, behind me, the, mm -hmm. the, the poster for the exhibition. And uh, I remember that Kyoko, because I told for, for so many years about doing music and about uh, this project. And I remember that I wrote only one song, which was not even based on, on uh, Henry's lyrics, and the song was called uh, "Become What You Are," uh, which is about telling the story of Henry Iger mostly. It was not uh, what was became before the album "Outsider," but anyway. So, but she, uh, Kyoko told me, but you know, there is this exhibition in a few months in Paris. Now you should release something. You should uh, show your music. And at the time, I had only one song. <laughs> So I, I I was a bit in a panic and I thought, okay, I have to do something, I have to do something. And I, I did, um, I called my friend, Mike, Mike Lindsay, which is a fantastic musician. And uh, many years before I, I told him about the story about Henry Dalger and uh, this the idea of doing a project around that. I remember even, even I, told, I shared this passion with a lot of different musicians that are friends like, uh, uh, or people I knew or met, like the quote from from Lamb Shop, uh, different people, you know, that thought maybe because at the time I thought it would be interesting to do like a collective project. I don't know with people inspired by Henry Dagger. At the time, just because of the pressure of uh, this exhibition, I, I say, okay, let's do, let's do, let's write some music, and I did it with Mike. So um, we we create five songs. And uh, we just released like an EP, like on vinyl, very special limited edition for the Musée d'Art Moderne de Paris, mm -hmm. the Modern Art Museum in Paris. And uh, and after it was so, I mean, art artistically so inspiring that I say, okay, let's now really want to do an album. And it became an album called Outsider. Um, uh, because in France we don't use very much this word in outsider. I know in America it's, uh, it's right, but in, in in France we you, you use our brute. Our yes? brute, exactly. Right. Our yes, brute. and and I think it might be worth just a, a quick mention. Mm -hmm. The exhibit yeah. at the Musée d'Art Moderne, uh, Kyoko had given a large quantity of Henry Darger artworks yeah. to the to the museum in right. Paris, and in 2015 there was a a large exhibition of that that gift of artwork, which often happens when there's a major gift. And they had photographs of the original room, not our recreated room where I'm sitting right now, but the original room on the wall. So you could get a sense of the clutter and the 
and the chaos in which Henry surrounded himself. Yes, yeah. So that was a that was an amazing exhibition. Yeah, exactly. Super amazing. Yeah. That's true. So and so then you you had this incredible you know composition, the album, the the five songs, and somehow that became a website and a podcast and a multimedia uh, performance presentation event. Um, you, you just kept going. Yes. Yeah, between like 2015 and and uh, 2021, where the album Outsider was released, because first we released these five tracks EP, but then after that we did more songs and really create a whole album with 10, 10 or 11 tracks. And uh, and when I wanted the year I wanted to release, it was the year where that was the pandemic. In, I wanted to release in 2020, but there was like the big or everything, the lockdown and everything it was quite impossible to, to release anything. So I just postponed from one year to 2021. Then we released this album, but it was still the pandemic. If you remember, you know, that it was still very difficult to do. It was impossible to do even concerts or gigs. or So I had to tell the story in another way. And, and, and I had to think out of the box, you know, okay, because generally as a musician, you, you plan to do, um, you plan to do like, uh, you do an album and then you do a show or a tour. But for this, because of the pandemic, I thought, okay, there is, I can't do that. So I have to do another way. And the other ways were to, to create, it then became, it came step by step, like, it, like a transmedia project. Transmedia, because I used different medias and to tell the story about Henry Dagger and the world that uh, we wanted to create inspired by Henry Dagger, which is called Outsider. And this is a world which is inspired by Henry Dagger, but in a, in a way, it's another world. And um, it's my, also my vision of, on, on his work, of course. And it's, it's but, and through the, to, to do that, it was, the best way was to to talk about uh, who was Henry, Henry Dagger to people who or met him or uh, worked around him, uh, inspired him, worked on his or being inspired by him. So the podcast, for example, so I, we did like two series of podcasts, one in French and one in English with different guests. And for the Ameri for the English version, there was few guests, uh, it, like uh, I had a converse, very interesting conversation with people from artists like Grayson Perry, Grayson Perry, like which is a Turner Price artist, a fantastic artist uh, from England, was completely uh, also blown away by Henry's, the Henry Dagger's art when he was 20, when he discovered that and completely changed his life and his art. But I, I, I told also with, um, Betsy Fuchs, Betsy Fuchs was sharing the, the room with Henry Dagger when, and David Berglund at the time in the late 60s, uh, but also like biographer uh, of people, specialists about Henry Dagger, like Mike, Mike Bonsteel, Jimmy Leach, uh, Mark Stokes, who made this documentary, very good documentary about Henry Dagger, but also you, Debra, you were also mm -hmm. the, the guest of my uh, one of my podcasts, and Keel Cole-Erner. So it was a really interesting, for me, it was extremely interesting to to talk with all those people who also are inspired in their life by Henry Dyer, and it became also uh, it's, I wanted to create also like a, like another kind of visual world, which was was not like uh, an animation of the the of the the character from from Dagger, but more like inspired by that. So mm -hmm. we did a bunch of videos. We became also a short film. And um, and this um, this has been presented a bit later as performance with an actor in France, a very cult actor called Denis Lavant. And we did some performances at the Musée d'Art Moderne de Paris and, and different things. And uh, and as you as you showed uh, the website, the website also is uh, there is like um, a lot of different parts, assets where you can go through uh, and learn more about Henry Dagger or learn more about Art Brut or Outsider Art. Or you can go also through um, 
uh, through the podcast. So yeah, you can listen to the album. You can also go to go to like a, a map, like a, called like a kind of Targaryen <laughs> map, where you can see where you can see Darga around the world, and you can go. Uh, you can watch the videos, of course, and on the um, yeah, that's how they say music, visual arts, and storytelling. Mm -hmm. Henry fantastic. Was, yeah, fantastic storyteller. So we the idea was to to tell the story about the storyteller. So um, one of the things that's happening here at Intuit in Chicago, Philippe, as you know, we are going to be completely renovating the museum. We're closing in September. We're going to close everything down and completely renovate the space. We're going to triple our size, um, expand into the lower level and the second floor. And we're going to completely reimagine the Henry Darger room and experience. That's why the room looks fairly empty right now because the objects that belong to Henry are wrapped and uh, looking at conservation of those objects. But um, one of the reasons we're doing this series is to think about how this room has impacted um, artists really around the world. And I love hearing from you how strong Henry's impact was on you, but you were also impacted by seeing Henry's actual belongings and the, and the physical recreation here. We wanna capture the power of that when we reopen the, the, new, the new space. Yeah, because it's, I, I think what's, what's what is fascinating with Henry Dagger, it's uh, of course his work is completely uh, incredible and, and so different from any, every, anything else. Because from when you look from, from far, it's, you, it looks a bit, it's colorful, looks a bit naive sometimes. But when you go deeper and when you start to work, to, to, to watch better, there is some scene where kind of pretty violent. There's also this, all the things about the genitalias of the, the, the girls with all the questions that it can bring. Why, uh, why these little girls have penises? So it's, it's a lot of questions and, and, it's, and it's, it's amazing about when art also not bring answers, but also a lot of questions. And for example, yeah, you can see on this, um, on the website that you can go through different, you can go to the world of, around Henry Dagger, you can go to the, you know, to the museum showing Dagger's work or, or, or like the Intuit or his room and, and different documents, but also you can, you can go through, um, uh, so, you know, through all the, um, the different things like the podcast, it's, it's in a way you, you are just, you're going to the, the world of Henry Dagger's world or, the world of Henry Dagger, but also the outsider world, you know. Um, so, um, so to to tell you to answer to your question, I think it's extremely inspiring for artists, because also because Henry was inspired by a lot of things from that he was was surrounded by. He was collecting, uh, I mean, magazine books. A lot of different things, and he was creating. In a way, as a musician, I can see a sampling. He was sampling, like a musician is sampling some old records, some vintage records, to create a new, a new kind of music. Like hip hop was based on that, or I, I do that all the time. I, I sample from my record collection, and Henry was sampling, like, images from books, magazine, papers. And he creates from that as a self-taught artist. And I feel very close connected to that because I'm also a self-taught artist, you know, a self-taught musician, sorry. And, and in a way, it shows that you can you can do everything from from scratch, or not from scratch, but from from anything who's surrounded you, surrounding you. And also what's it's, for me it's inspiring. But in this world now we are now, where everything is so, so connected with uh, the world. We are so connected through the social medias and uh, and students. That Henry Dagger was the opposite of that. He creates like a, a, like a huge amount of work of art without showing to anyone, which means that in this world where 
we wanted to be liked on Instagram, liked on Facebook, you know, and uh, we show everything that we do, even what we are eating, <laughs> you know. Henry didn't show to anyone because, and it's really the, the question and the, it's the main thing mostly before the outsider artists, it's uh, that they create for um, by necessity. And it's right. a very right. strong, you know, very powerful when you just create art for art and for nothing else, not to be loved, liked, or appreciated by your, by, so, of course, it's we, extremely inspiring for, for anyone. Philippe, we have some questions from our audience, and I want to ask some of those, and then I have a couple more questions of my own of their time. Um, did This is from Lisa Runquist, who I think you've also interviewed. Did Darger's color palette and visual patterns inspire your music? Absolutely. Completely. That's when with Mike we we were working on the on the music and composing the and and uh, arranging and producing the music. We 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 had a slide show and Kyoko she gave me like a, a very precious USB key where you have all the all the art Dagger's art on on and we were just all the time having Henry. Targa's uh, art in front of our eyes to, to never forget what was the inspiration. And, and we tried, uh, I hope we succeeded, but we tried mostly to, 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 to recreate sonically what we could, what we were watching on his work. Even, you know, we were saying with Mike, uh, we have to listen, we have to hear the, the, the tape that he has, that they put sometimes on the, on the papers, you know, we have to hear not the sound of the tape, of course, but this roughness that you can see on his uh, and on his work, and also the the, the color colorful because Henry was an amazing colorist. Maybe he was not a, a fantastic technician, you know, uh, as a as a for the for, as a drawer, but he was a in, very inspired artist and very inspired colorist. And so we tried, of course, to recreate this palette of colors musically. Um, and also we tried to do pop music in some ways. To do, to, we, we didn't want to do something too, exp too, too experimental because, because what he's doing is pop art. You know, it's, uh, it's for me, I mean, I feel that it's a kind of pop art. Uh, because Henry, even if he didn't show his work to to the to the people, he was inspired by the popular art, by uh, popular, uh, I mean, pop iconic iconic uh, like um, Shirley Temple. But Shirley Temple is an iconic pop star, you know. Uh, so we wanted to create songs which was really kind of pop songs. But inside the pop song, all the arrangement and production has to well, was pretty experimental, and and we even had uh, two amazing singers, Adam Adam Glover, which is amazing young crooner. He's a he, he really far from he sounds like <laughs> in a way like uh, the voice going. I don't know mm. for me, it's kind of perfect deep. a perfect fit for perfect Henry's fit, work. Exactly. And Hannah Peel, which is an amazing singer, but also multi-instrumentist. And I, I remember with Mike, we even, sometimes we were just, um, it was so much so in tune that we sometimes we detune a bit the sounds of the, vo <laughs> the, vo the choir to make it sound a bit weird, you know, a bit bizarre, like 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 the world that you can see the, with the blankings and the, and the- Yeah, a little bit off key, right? Exactly. A little, I mean, that's actually an expression in English that, something that feels off key or exactly yeah it's exactly what we wanted to create on that and kind of nice. something kind of baroque and flamboyant like what we can feel from from his art that's wonderful that's wonderful when you when you gave a presentation of this amazing musical extra extravaganza at uh, the Musée d'Art Moderne where you had the French actor um what was the what was the reaction from the audiences and and from the museum people there it must have 
been quite quite it, excited. Yeah, it was it was amazing. It was like uh, during like a special event called La Nuit des Musées, the Night of Museum, which is an European uh, night where all the museums are open and they there is some paper. I mean events, performances, mm -hmm. concerts. And we did on the same day, five performances, like 30 minutes each. So it was quite a <laughs> marathon. And uh, and so we had a, a lot of different people, people we knew very well about Henry Dagger, very well, uh, young or older people where we knew who was Henry Dagger. And so is there the, a lot of popularity for Henry in Paris it, and in it's, France? It's, um, it's an interesting question because I, I don't have the answer because for the people who know about Art Brut or outside art, they know, of course, Henry Dagger. Sure. Some people they, in France, they don't know just the name, but when they when you explain what it is and or when you show them, it's say, ah, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. I, because you, you, I think you cannot pass by in front of Henry Dagger's art without noticing. So that's his- I think there's there. a real affinity for the work, particularly in France. We get so at Intuit, I would say about half of our visitors come already knowing about Henry and about half discover him when they get here. Yeah. But we get a lot of French visitors. I think there's yeah. there's something there's something that particularly appeals to, yeah. maybe, maybe it's because the, all Saint Pierre, the museum is in yeah. uh, Montmartre. Maybe it's because there's such a wonderful collection of Dargers at the Musée d'Art Moderne. But mm -hmm. um, you know, well, of course, Art Brut uh, started, if it, if you will, in France with French artist Jean Dubuffet, who anointed this genre of art with that term. Yeah. So I think that there, and of course, Jean Dubuffet came to Chicago in the early '50s, gave a speech at the Arts Club of Chicago called. The, anti-cultural positions and found an excited and willing audience here. So there's actually something very special about Chicago being an early adopter of this genre and believing in this genre and, and focusing on this genre, which is why Intuit is here in Chicago and uh, the Jean Dubuffet launching it. So I think there's a very close connection here between Chicago and Paris and that your work is is more fully strengthening that relationship because you are going to come to Chicago and we are going to present this next year when we reopen the museum. So we're very excited. We've been talking about this for more than a year and we're very excited to present, bring this incredible presentation performance to Chicago audiences who are very enthusiastic about Henry. Great, can't wait. I can't wait either. I can't wait either. <laughs> so if you're if you're tuning in from uh, New York or Los Angeles or Atlanta or other places, we are looking for additional venues so that we can tour, put a tour on when when you get to the United States. Um, I have a couple more questions. Um, uh, Marianne was a young graduate student living in Chicago when the art was discovered first in the apartment and. And she, years later in Florida, discovered a book about him called Throw Away Boy. I think those of us who are uh, really? familiar with Henry are familiar with that book. And she's, uh, she's that book actually rekindled her interest in art and she discovered into it and she's wishing she was here with us. So uh, Marianne and others, please come, come back uh, next year when we reopen the room. Um, but she mostly wishes Henry could know how much his work is lauded and revered now because he did suffer for his genius. And then Catherine says, what would you say to Henry if you could speak to him today? Philippe, what would you say? That's a um, tough question, Catherine. I, I, will, I, will, I will talk about the weather, I think. I will first talk <laughs> about the weather. I would say, you know what, in Paris, it's so hot at the moment, it's so warm. And uh, I will talk about the weather because it was his main subject of conversation. So at first I will start to talk about that. And after I will, if he, because he was not very talkative from what uh, Kiyoko was saying, uh, after I will, uh, I will maybe ask him uh, about, maybe I would love to know why he didn't want to show it to others, why he wanted to keep for himself. I would love to know that. And I will talk also about music with him because, uh, 
And we've in this room, there was a, a lot of uh, wax records, you know, like a, a big amount of uh, like a big collection of wax records. And even on the on the website, you can find also on Spotify also the the playlist of the music that he was listening because thanks to Mike Bonsil, he sent me the um, he because Darga was writing everything, like mostly everything, and he was writing all the. Um, the record that he was buying with a price and uh, and and I, I had this this list and uh, from that i did like the playlist to know what to 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 understand a bit better the man behind uh, the art and and it's and for me as a musician of course it's very interesting to to listen to the music that he was listening uh during his life or that he was collecting so it's and it's very interesting to to see that he was collecting rec like uh, jazz jazz records classical music uh even sketch you know like i mean i say sketch like a stand up comedy you mm -hmm. know um uh of course a lot of military music and uh a song from the secession war uh yeah after after you and i met we i sent you some lyrics because we had some some yeah. lyrics he had written where he had uh, lifted the words from familiar war songs and inserted his own uh, names of characters and twisted the lyrics around and and mashed them together. So he had uh, taken some pieces from "It's a Long Way uh, to Tipperary" yeah. and other well-known World War One songs, yeah. and I made a copy of those and sent them to you uh, because yeah, yeah, I, I knew that those would be yes, we, them, you would yeah. be interested in those. Is, Great, was, was, and just like and just like with his writings, and Michael Bonesteel, um, when we did an exhibit in 2021, Michael helped us because he had found excerpts from familiar books, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Alice in Wonderland, uh, others that were. Henry had lifted entire sections of the writings, almost word for word, but mm -hmm. inserted the names of his characters and the incidents that were happening in his book. So not everything was original. And I admire that Michael was able to track down these very specific passages yeah. in Henry's work and in uh, this uh, popular fiction. Yeah. yeah. In a way, it's, it's what he was, what are you saying? It's exactly that because he was, what he was doing visually with like sampling, like, uh, let's say the image of Shirley Temple and all the, the, the girl from Copperton uh, commercials and duplicating and, and creating his own characters like that. That's exactly what he, do, he did also with the lyrics. You know, for example, a song, the first song of the Outsider album is called Who Will Follow Angelina? And who will follow Angelina is completely based on the, on the, uh, the Christian uh, song called Who Will Follow Jesus. And the lyrics are the same. Even right. I was very surprised that even the song that I thought there was a song called Can You Forget, can, no, can a Boy Forget His Mother? This one, I was so sure that it was very personal because all the story behind is for his during his childhood that he lost his uh, mother when, when he was four. Uh, so I was sure that this this song was very autobiographical, but it was not. It's also taken from uh, from a Christian song or from something that he listened that he heard at the church. So right. it's uh, it's so it's interesting. How... It was a bit of a in in English we say a magpie, like the bird, like stealing from exactly. different pieces. Stealing, yeah, but doing something personal in the same time because it's very personal yes. what he was doing, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so we, we have a we have a question from Martina, who's in Croatia, mm -hmm. and she's asking why was Henry obsessed with young girls and troubled childhood images? And I'll take a stab at this one. Um, we did an, a wonderful exhibition with uh, Lisa Runquist, who is um, joining us today. And Lisa has done extensive research on the popular culture influences like um, Shirley Temple and other influences. Um, clearly, Henry saw himself as a protector of children, given the situation he was in with um, being institutionalized as a child. And we, uh, not a shameless plug, but we have a wonderful little catalog that we produced that talks about 
um, betwixt and between uh, what were the influences? Why did, um, why was Henry obsessed with little girls? What were the influences around that? And, um, and I think that you would enjoy reading it. It was only $5. So uh, shoot us a note at intuitedart.org. Um, let's see, did you, did you honor the intersection between his, uh, you know, religious convictions, his dedication to the, the Catholic church and his art in your musical compositions? Absolutely, completely, we, we did that. There is even um, one song we're starting with some, uh, some music from the, it's a very old records that, that uh, I sampled. It's a song from, uh, from, I don't know if it was Louisiana churches, you know, from 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 long time ago. Yeah, I tried to to, to get to give this spiritual or um, Christian, um, uh, mu I mean, Christian church music into the into our music use through the use. They, we use also some church organ. I've got like an harmonium in my studio. Like from the church, you know, and and we use this kind of sounds, yeah, because it was, it it's it was it would, I think it was difficult to avoid that, you know, because it's so present in his work, so present in his writing, that um, and and we know that he was going from three three to five times a day to the church, you know, uh, he has a very strong strange relationship even with God and Jesus. Sometimes he was uh, blaspheming. And sometime you and after he was feeling so guilty that he had to go to church, he, in a way, he had a kind of dialogue with his own personal intimate dialogue with God and with Jesus. And this is, and it's uh, something which is uh, like we can relate to art because art is also uh, something. It's very spiritual. I think uh, music or art mm -hmm. can be very spiritual. Absolutely. Henry, Henry was kind of connected in some ways, yeah. We know from actually research shows that being creative and making art can reduce stress. It reduces reliance on drugs and it increases empathy. So the research has proven that out. That's one of the reasons why here at Intuit, we um, encourage everyone to get creative in whatever way makes sense and to not be hung up about um, technical drawing and sculpting skills that you can collage, you can trace, just mm -hmm. like Henry did. Um, that's one of the things that we want to be able to offer when we re renovate the museum is a, is a place where you can sit down and make art like Henry. Mm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. yeah. 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 Oh. And, and, yeah. I want, uh, I want just Go ahead, Philippe. Yeah. And I want to say also because uh, just before you ask, you were asking about uh, how. Henry Daggers can be inspiring, but it's it's in, inspire a lot of people, you know, uh, a lot of different musicians. Also, David Byrne, Sufjan Stevens uh, wrote a song which is completely inspired by Henry Dagger. Uh, there is a French band called Andochine who made a song called Henry Dagger. Uh, there is uh, also Devon Rebenhart, you know, uh, very inspired by Henry Dagger, without without naming. Uh, of course, artists like Chapman Brothers, as I just we talk about Grayson Perry, even the, there was Kyoko Lerner, she introduced me to a fashion designer in Japan who's uh, who recreate his own uh, very, very interesting fashion, um, uh, probably uh, inspired by Henry Dagger. So it's in a way, it's yeah, it's uh, it's it's like a like a chain or like, a, I don't know how you say in English, but to pass the witness when you run, you give to someone else. And after you don't, you know, you yes. run. Yes, someone. you pass the baton or, the baton or yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or even in some cases we talk about paying it forward, right? Yeah. When we yeah, do something, you know, when we do something and nice for someone else. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And we have to really also um, uh, say how, how Nathan Lerner and Kyoko Lerner, the work they did, you know, for, for, of course, we can be, we are very lucky that Nathan Lerner was an artist himself. And he's, when he, they discovered his work, that 
he was aware and he, he realized that it was strong and powerful and that they didn't because it could be thrown away in any garbage you know like uh, if someone is not interested by will not see the, this uh, this uh, this uh, preciosity or the, the, the how strong it was we'll, we will never heard about uh, Henry Dagger so what the discovery of Nathan and all the work that they did all this, those years to to make to 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 make this that Henry Dagger now is recognized like like a, so not only at, outside the artist we I talk with the, the the head of the Musée d'Art Moderne for him it's like Van Gogh you know it's like is is one of the most important artists the main artist of the the twentieth century so it's not only an outsider artist it's also just a modern artist you know a modern artist and and it is really we can we can be um, very grateful to to the to Nathan Lemaire and Kyoko during all those years you know to, to, to they really supported the, because now of course it's kind of obvious that Henry Dagger is huge but we can imagine that during in, in the 70s in the 80s in the 90s you know it was not that simple and not that easy absolutely Absolutely. Well, we're coming to the end. Are there any other questions from our participants? Um, let me just, uh, while I'm waiting for questions, I'll just make my next plug. Um, next month, we're going to be talking with uh, Lisa Stone, who was the original co-curator of Intuit's Darker Room, and mm -hmm. teacher Sydney Walters, who's a teaching artist who has used uh, her experiences with Henry's artwork and her experience of viewing the room in her classroom and in her own artistic practice. So she, she's a visual artist who's gonna talk about the influences that um, Henry and Intuit have had on her work. So I'm excited for that. That will be, sorry, just, that'll be the first Friday in July. And that is July 7th. Okay, so we'll be back here on July 7th. Philippe, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, for your time. Um, it was really wonderful to be with you. So exciting. Um, I'm I'm seeing some uh, merci, merci is coming up. <laughs> merci, merci. Much appreciation to all. Um, yes, it's just, it's w wonderful what you've accomplished. And we're looking forward to in the future revealing more uh, yeah. about the work and the artistic practice of Henry Darger. So thank you all for joining me. And, and of course, thank you, Philippe. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.